Good morning, and welcome to our online worship service today. I'm Pastor Carl Hauser from Southminster Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Jennifer from First United Presbyterian Church of Granite City. We're so glad you're able to join with us today. So in the spirit of God's love and everlasting forgiveness, let us open up our hearts to the Holy Spirit this morning. Welcome. Sing praise to God, who reigns above the God of all creation. The God of power, the God of love, the God of all salvation. With healing love, my soul is filled. Please join us now in our responsive call to worship. We come as listeners needing a voice of comfort. The, the word, word of God, God is soft and gentle, gentle to our ears. ears. We come as workers needing a voice of direction. The, the word, word of God, God is brave and it strengthens our hands. We come as smart, rational people needing a voice of hope. The, the word, word of God, God is genuine filled with promises and blessings beyond our understanding. Now for our prayer of adoration and confession. God, creator of all, who goes by many names, El Shaddai, Adonai, Elohim, and Father, there is no one quite like you that stands above us all. You live beyond creation, but are alive within our hearts. We look at the complex universe and are humbled by your grace. You have offered us life beyond mortality and hope amid our sin. We're called to be your people, for you have called us in. Hear us now with our unison prayer of confession. Though we have all felt the depression and shame of sin, God does not leave us there, but instead offers us hope through grace. Let us give up the wrongs, the hurts, the jealousies, and the anger that fuels destruction. Let us receive the grace that reminds us we are not simply broken sinners, but beloved children of God. Let us take a moment now for silent meditation. Hear the good news of the gospel. We are not bound by our sins or the sins of one another. We, we have, have been washed and redeemed, called and collected into the household of faith. Jesus has given his life so that we might have life. By the name of Jesus, we have been redeemed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Miss Julie 
and I'm really happy to be getting the chance to talk to you again. I miss you all so, so much, and I can't wait until we can be back together in person um, to sing and play and celebrate um, and worship. Uh, today is Father's Day. Can you believe it? Father's Day. It's really, the summer's really going along, and it's Father's Day already. And you know what? Recently, I found out what the word father stands for. Did you know that? So father, which is another word for dad or daddy, like there's a lot of words for that. Did you ever think about that? Like father, dad, daddy, paw, pop, 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 uh, grandpa, paw, paw, poppy, um, um, opa, all these words for, for dad or grandpa, or sometimes even people have an uncle that's really important to them, like a father. And I found out what the word father stands for. So I have my letters here and I'm gonna tell you how to spell father and what it stands for. Okay, so first is F, right? F stands for funny because dads can be really, really funny. They really like to make jokes and they can be very funny. Like my dad is so funny because he knows that my little boy does not like broccoli. He hates broccoli. And so every time we get ice cream, when my dad puts down the ice cream, he says, and here's your broccoli ice cream, because it's hilarious. And my dad is also really good at sending really funny text messages, which you wouldn't have necessarily thought that. And you probably don't get text messages, but he's really good at that sending funny text messages. He makes me laugh almost every day with a funny text message. Um, a is the next letter in father. And A stands for always, because fathers are always there for you. Whether it's early in the morning and you are awake and you want breakfast and mom is still asleep, or whether it's late at night and you are scared and you had a bad dream and you need someone, your father is always there for you, right? And T, T is for teacher, because fathers are really important teachers in our lives. They teach us very important things. My dad taught me how to ride a bike. My dad taught me how to root for the Cardinals, which is one of the most important things. And my dad taught me how to, uh, how to fix a toilet if it gets broken, which is a really important thing. Probably not something you guys should try at your age, but when you get big, ask your dad, it's important. H is for helper, helper. And dads are really good helpers when you have something you need to do. Like when you need to um, fix a toy, that is broken or something needs new batteries or when you don't know how to work your computer login or when you move to a fifth floor walk-up apartment in Brooklyn and you need help moving in your dad will help you with that because dads are really good helpers E is for encourage which means to cheer you on they'll be your cheerleader they'll cheer you on and dads encourage their children because they always want what's best for them. And R is for ready to pick you up every time you fall. And boy, I'll tell you what, that doesn't just mean like when you fall off the slide or when you fall off your bike, but when you have a problem in your life, your dad will always be ready to pick you up when you fall. I know my dad has always been there for me and my brothers and sisters whenever we needed them. So when you put them all together, that spells father, father. And you know, a lot of people use the word father to refer to God, to refer to God in heaven. And they talk about God the father uh, because God has all of those important traits that a good father has. God will always be there for you. God teaches us how to be good people in the world. God will help you when you're in need. The word of God will encourage you. And God will always be ready to pick you up when you fall. So say a prayer with me. Dear God, Thank you for our fathers. 
and thank you for being our Father. Help us to be grateful for the gifts our fathers give. Okay? Amen. I love you guys. I hope I get to see you soon. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there um, and to my dad. Love you very much. Bye. Let us pray for the Holy Spirit's illumination of our hearts and minds. O God, who has given us your word, who has given of your very self in your Son, we pray that your Holy Spirit would grant us wisdom and insight into your word as we hear it read and preached today. May it touch our hearts and transform our lives in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Genesis 21, verses 8 through 21. This is referring to Isaac, of course. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. As she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand for I will make a great nation of him. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Our epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 1b through 11. Should we continue to sin in order that grace may abound? 
by no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. Jesus is speaking. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Good morning again, and uh, welcome to very complicated scripture passage day. I don't think it was labeled like that in the lectionary, but that seems to be what it is about, right? You have the story about Abraham sending away Ishmael and his wife's commanding it to do so because she's jealous of her kids and the way that Ishmael and Isaac are fighting. You've also got this passage of Jesus telling all of his people that he's come not to bring peace, but a sword. That he's come to bring fighting among families. How is that a good thing? How are these passages even related? And why can't we just skip this day? And I want to start off with a question. Who do you argue with the most? A friend, a family member, someone in your household, someone online? Okay, now that I've given you a minute to think about it, what do you normally fight about? Is it about principled things? About ideology? About values? Or do you fight about laundry and how much time someone they think should be spending around the house or doing chores or anything like that? You see, we argue with people in our household because they're close to us. They give us support and encouragement when we need it. 
but they're also their own people and they can get into they can get under our skin they can annoy us so what are we supposed to do with this passage of Jesus when he's talking about these families fighting with each other and with Abraham splitting up his family essentially getting rid of one of his disowning one of his sons I think the key thing to remember is that you have to interpret scripture with scripture this is a little idiom that I learned while I was in seminary and at first when I heard interpret scripture with scripture I thought that seems kind of dumb why what does that even mean and the key thing that says that when you get to a passage that doesn't make any sense or that seems to be promoting values that are different from the rest of the Bible how do the other values and other passages of scripture inform this passage so in looking at the passage of Abraham sending away Isaac Look at the earlier passages when God promises to Abraham and he says, I will make you the father of many nations. I don't think Abraham had forgotten that when he had Ishmael and then had Isaac and then had to send Ishmael away. It grieved him in his heart, no doubt. But then God assured him in his prayers, I will be with Ishmael. This is part of my plan for you. Have faith and it will go well with you. So he does. Abraham listens to Sarah, and God does exactly what God promised. And Abraham was able to rest in faith, to have peace, to know that even though it might not have been what he thought was best, he did what God thought was best. And the same passage with Jesus, when he says that he's come to set family members against one another, I don't think it's because he intentionally wants us to fight. He doesn't want us to be like, I'm going to argue with you, and I'm going to argue with you, and why did you say that, and I hate you. That's not really Jesus' goal. He doesn't go around picking fights so much with people and telling them, you know what, if you really want to spread the gospel, get a bunch of swords and go kill people and get into a lot of bar fights and argue and make sure you beat up a lot of people. So when we read this passage in Matthew, we have to know Jesus is coming at this metaphorically. It's not literally about turning family members against each other, not literally taking up a sword. So what does Jesus normally promise in the rest of Scripture? What does the rest of the Bible tell us that can help inform these passages? When Jennifer and I were in college, we had a great uh, marriage counselor who actually taught it as part of the seminary experience that couples who are going into ministry could come to these therapy sessions and talk through what it means to be pastors and but ultimately what it came down to was about how we communicated Jennifer and I my wife and I and it was so insightful because one of the key things they pointed out is that when you're stressed you have coping mechanisms and those coping mechanisms can be healthy or they can be unhealthy so when you and your families fight that is a coping mechanism to deal with stress so when there's laundry piled up that you don't like, when someone stays out late, when someone makes a decision that you don't agree with, it causes you stress. And that's why you argue. You argue because you're stressed. So if we can check our own stress and take a deep breath and empathize with what the other person might be feeling, there's an opportunity for us to break the cycle of stress to break the arguments and to come to an agreement, to come to an understanding. And I think ultimately what Jesus was saying was that he says, no one who puts father or mother or brother ahead of me will find place in my kingdom. That they have to love me first of all, above all. Now I think it's important to recognize that Jesus does not say to hate the rest of your family. Jesus doesn't say, I want you to go and argue with everybody. But I think he says, put him first, the way Abraham did. The way Abraham received a peace that passes all understanding. The way Abraham was able to live in faith and be part of God's promise. I'm sure Abraham felt stressed before, but after his time of prayer, he felt relieved. He felt that he could talk with Sarah. He felt that he could know that God was going to protect Ishmael and Hagar. And indeed, God does. When Jesus comes and says, families are going to fight, that's kind of what families do at times. 
But he says, if you put me first, if you put me above all, I will give you a peace that transcends all understanding. If you put me ahead of your family, if you put me, not in a sense of degrading your family, but put me first, come to me first, I will help you with your family. For in this counseling session, this idea of stress, one of the things that we are told to do um, as a couple is that when we get into an argument, when we get ourselves feeling stressed, to stop, to say out loud what is causing us to feel upset or stressed. I am upset that the dishes all get piled this certain way in the sink. Ah! And then Jennifer can respond and she can say, I empathize with that. I know it must be frustrating. I can see that it makes you stressed. And then I have to say, but you know what? I am a child of God. And the truth is, how the dishes are piled does not affect how God sees me. How the dishes are arranged does not affect my worth in God's eyes, for God loves me, and I don't have to worry so much about the dishes. And in doing that, suddenly I don't have to yell at Jennifer about the way the dishes are stacked, and she doesn't have to get defensive and yell at me about me yelling at her, and we don't have to yell anymore. It's been a great tool for us. Not that we yelled at each other all that much, but what we do when we do get stressed, like I'm sure you have felt stressed, you've felt stressed with your kids, with your parents, with your spouses. When you get stressed, take a step back, take a deep breath, and remind yourself of what Christ has done for you. And that whatever you're stressed about, God is with you. God is with you in that moment. So whatever you're saying to your family, whatever you're yelling at your spouse, you don't have to feel the weight and burden of the entire world on your shoulders every time you get into an argument. Your family is great. They can be a huge blessing. They can also be our worst nightmare. On the cover of the bulletin, there's a picture of a child who drew a fairly typical picture of parents and the kids holding hands in a tree, you know, like you'd expect a kid's drawing to be. But the reflection down below it is a family that was in a severe state of stress and dysfunction, and the child drew that picture. Visually expressing what it looks like when we have dysfunctional relationships, when we're not able to communicate, when we put our own pride and ego ahead of others and we try to just get our way, and we said we yell, we belittle, we demean, we shame other people. And Jesus says that's not the way that's going to bring peace. That may be what your family does at times. For I know, you know, my own family of origin, your family of origin, wherever we've been, we've experienced pain. It's Father's Day weekend. And I must say, I do enjoy the privilege of having a son that God has gifted us. I hope he knows that we put God first in our family. That when we do get stressed and we do want to yell and argue that we'll take a step back, take a deep breath and remind ourselves God is here. God loves us. God loves me. God loves you. And God sent Jesus to remind us that even though we might argue with our family, if we put him first, we can have a deep peace that will get us through this. We don't have to be stressed about the things that we argue about. We don't have to carry the weight along with us into every argument that we have. We don't have to relive our past hurts every day. We can give them to God and be forgiven. So however you feel stressed, whenever you feel stressed, take a deep breath. In fact, let's take a deep breath with me now. Close your eyes and take a deep breath in and out. And remind yourself, I am a child of God. And take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. I can choose to not be stressed, for I am a child of God. When we recognize that we are children of God, that he will love us and provide for us, even though we find ourselves like Hagar and Ishmael out in the desert, certain of our own death, 
abandoned by the ones we thought we loved, we know that there is a God, a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a God of Hagar and Sarah, a God of Carl and Jennifer, a God for you. We come now of our time of dedication. This is a moment to take pause, to take in a deep breath and to release it, knowing that the God who gives the breath to our lungs is the God who provides for all our needs. And so we turn in gratitude to God, thanking God for all that we have, all that we are, and all that we may one day be belongs to the Lord. May we take this moment to recommit ourselves to following Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and to rededicate ourselves to the work of God in the world. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord turn face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 We come now to our time of the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Through dreams and visions, O God, you broaden the horizon and hope of your people, that they may discover the meaning of your covenant, even in the midst of trial and exile. Increase the number of those who believe in your word, 
so that all people may joyfully respond to your call and share in your promises. Amen. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the need of our siblings as dear to us as our own needs. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we offer our thanksgivings and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. We pray for birthdays celebrated. We pray for anniversaries remembered. We pray for new births. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for your world of hope and for your people who cry out. We pray for laughter and celebration and for where strife hardens hearts. We pray for our fathers, as good or bad as we may think of them, and for those who have stepped in to be like a father for someone else, we pray. God, you are the one who looks over us, guides us, and shepherds us. Hear our prayers, God of power, and through the ministry of your Son, free us from the grip of the tomb, that we may desire you as the fullness of life and proclaim your saving deeds to all the world. Amen. Let us now join in the words that Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So from our family to yours, may the Lord God who blesses us, may Yay! Jesus Christ who gives us his spirit, may he bless you and your family this day and every day. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.